Hello everyone, it's Kelly from The Hub, here today with our friend Sharon from Wellspan Wellness Center. Remember, she's the woman who does all the stuff about trauma and addiction and all those kinds of things. So, hello there, my friend. How are you? I'm well. How are you, Kelly? I'm doing very well. I was looking at our list today and we're talking about, oh, I have to relook at it again. I know everybody knows that th this is where the lists are. <laughs> We are talking about childhood adversity and the physical health of kids. Correct. Or, or actually, your physical health because you've had childhood um, um, adversity. And so this is fascinating. The health of, that you have as an adult can be partially determined, partially, by things that have happened to you in your youth. Talk about that. I'm fascinated. Well, the overall picture is about self-care. If you haven't learned as a child how to take care of yourself in a way that promotes health, you learn to take care of yourself in a way that probably doesn't promote health. So you might turn to food and, and food in a way that, uh, I, I mean, just because you had childhood adversity doesn't mean directly that you are going to be a compulsive overeater. There's right. a correlation there. Right. You learn that food makes you feel good. And there's a lot of other things that, I mean, Kelly, I know you and I've talked about this food. We, we could do like forever on food. Yep. So, uh, but overeating leads to obesity, which leads to being more susceptible to heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, diabetes. So it's on a continuum. So if you never learned healthy eating habits as a child, maybe because of the adversity in your family, um, maybe there wasn't a caregiver who knew anything about nutrition or who just wanted the kids to shut up and they didn't care what they gave them to eat because they were so stressed out. So that carries through to adulthood. The habits we learn as a child, good, bad, and different, carry through to adulthood. They become ingrained. They're part of who we are. So we were talking earlier, and, and I think that this is, you know, this is absolutely appropriate. And Sharon and I have, have shared stories about this in that if you were good and you were well-behaved, in my family, we could go to this, like, ice cream stand, and you could get ice cream. And so if I, like, if you were, I knew that. And to this day, that place is very special to me. And going out for ice cream because you're good is a huge thing. And I've done that for my niece. My niece is, is seven, and there are times when I'm with her, and I'm like, you have been so good. Do you want to get ice cream? Mm -hmm. And when I said it to her the first time, I went, oh my God, I just did that. I didn't realize that it was that, like I made those decisions, good equals ice cream. Even though I totally knew it, I never thought I would do it like that. And, I'm, and we're not saying that that's a bad thing, but we're saying that that is a learned behavior. And why did my parents do that? We weren't, my parents were not, I love you people. Whether that's good or bad, that's not part of the, this conversation. They show their love through food. Mm -hmm. and, and carry that further. If there's a family that, say, just generally speaking, dad is a pretty abusive alcoholic. So mom's job is to keep dad happy so nothing sets him off. Yep. And noisy kids make dad unhappy. So then dad starts the ranting, raving, whatever. So mom does anything she can possibly do to keep the kids quiet. And what keeps kids quiet often is food. So that pattern of let's not deal with what's going on in the household. Let's not talk about it. Let's eat. So later on as adults, that becomes with, and this is a saying from Overeaters Anonymous, you need to face your stuff rather than stuff your face. So all along, you haven't learned 
to be able to express, I'm scared, I'm <clears throat> angry, I don't want to live like this. So in, in a household where there's a lot of adversity, children are not given the space to express themselves appropriately. Hmm. So they have to somehow find a way to keep those feelings down. So keeping them down, energy gets stuck, leads to pain. <clears throat> in children, you can have uh, a lot of kids with tummy aches. A lot of kids with headaches and you think, oh, well, it's a stress of school or, you know, they're being bullied or, you know, they're just finicky eaters and, uh, but it's never looked at, wow, this child has a stomach ache every day. What's going on in their household? Then as adults, guess what they have a problem with? Digestive disorders. So it, it really carries through. Hmm. And, That's and, interesting. Uh, I, well, I had to take swimming lessons when I went to day camp and I hated it. I was terrified. And I used to say that my stomach hurt. Uh, some of those times it was a lie and some of those times it was a truth. I think I worked myself up into that. And that, ha that did not manifest into something that I do as an adult. But you're right. When I hear you say that, I that could have manifested into something I do as an adult. Oh, no, I can't. Oh, I just don't feel well. No. So rather than say, exactly, rather than say, I don't want to do that. I don't like that. I don't have the skills for it. I'm afraid I'll fail. Because I did. I knew, I knew I was going to fail. Oh, I knew it. So I'm going to have a stomach ache. Then I don't have to do it. And I don't have to be accountable or responsible for my feelings. Yep. Because after all, you can't get mad at a kid that has a stomach ache for Absolutely. Ache. Absolutely. So I didn't have to work through my feelings. I didn't have to participate. I didn't have to face something that I wasn't good at. So in my universe, everything was happy. So now, it had, had things been different for you, carry that through to adulthood, and you're in a new job. And now you're given a new task that you don't know how to do. Guess what? You're going to tell your boss, oh, I'm really sorry. I got to go. I have a terrible stomach ache. I think maybe I have the virus and I don't want to infect people. Boss says, see ya, out the door. I don't want you to infect people either. Right. And, those and it's unconscious. It's not deliberate. Right, 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 right. Because you couldn't, I couldn't have worked through those moments of being of figuring it out right. i chose to do something else i created a physical problem because i couldn't deal with the, with the stuff and isn't that very creative that shows you how creative our minds are and how wonderful our minds work to protect us Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And is it, I mean, that's a really complicated thing. I, I, I was protecting myself from things I didn't want, from things that I thought would hurt me, whether that was psychological hurt or physical hurt. Yeah. I wish, don't you always wish that you could see the parts of your brain and going, bing, bing. I know that you can when you, you know, when you have those tests or whatever and you can see yeah, them yeah. light up or like, oh, this is what she's doing. Oh, it's back here. Oh, there's stuff over here. I, I always think that that's bad. I wish you could do that like yourself. Oh, she's got fight or flight. I can see it right there. I mean, you, lots of times you can see that in how people's reactions are, but it would be cool if you could be like, Broop, her amygdala is really going crazy. <laughs> Oh, I've just triggered. Oh, she's, she's really logical right now. She's working on that part of her. I, I just think that that's fascinating to be able to see that. You're right. I was trying to protect myself. And hmm. in, in an odd sort of way, in therapy world, they call that secondary gains. But, but secondary gain from an illness, secondary gain from a particular behavior. You had a positive gain from that behavior. So why would you want to get rid of it? Ah, okay. It, it, it's your shield. It's your protection. 
Right. And I got, I got positive attention, which wasn't really positive attention because I didn't feel well. I was cared for. Yeah. Uh, it it's was all, yeah. So now, now you're, you know, a 40 year old adult and you're having medical issues and everybody goes, well, you know, just change your diet or well, secondary gains, just stop doing it. It's right. so ingrained. Right. And, right. and, and please hear me, there are physical ailments that are purely physical ailments. However, the, the adversity piece affects self-care in dealing with those physical ailments. And it is possible, like a medication regime, about a new diet, uh, exercise, which is not on my favorite list of words. I know. <laughs> So now the diet uh, doctor tells you you need to change your diet and start exercising. And yesterday you weren't taking any medications. Today you go home with three prescriptions. That's a lot to manage. You are making life major lifestyle changes. And, and I like lots of times it feels like you're doing it alone. And, and no one's and no one's really okay. And, and when I say no one's really, so no one's walking you through like that stuff of it yes i'm like well how is walking around the block gonna help me with my whatever you know whatever you're you were just diagnosed with because right. you think i'm now i gotta add one more dumb thing to my list that i don't want to do because i'd rather just have chips or you know what i mean those are those unconscious things you do oh and we're not blaming doctors or any of those or clinicians in any yeah, way no but when you see how all these parts are connected, you go, oh, oh. Yeah. So, so you have somebody who is resistant to starting insulin. They're diabetic. Yep. And, and they have all kinds of health issues related to that. And they need to lose weight, lower their A1C, lower their sugar levels, cholesterol levels, triglyceride levels. What they hear is wah, 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 wah. Right. They're overwhelmed. Yep. Fear kicks in. I can't do this. I can't do this alone. It's too complicated. Where do I start? I don't want to start. Now I'm scared. And I know this because a lot of patients who I see to quit smoking are also diabetic. And they're scared and they smoke to deal with their scared. So now we take the cigarettes away. What are they doing to deal with their scared? Because when they were three, they were scared because dad was a raging alcoholic and they never learned to cope with it. They learned to avoid it, deny it, push it down. They never learned to cope. So it is. You, it's so interconnected. You're so right, Kelly. It's so interconnected. And, and we can't... We can't look at just one aspect of a person. They have a physical illness. We're not going to look at the emotional component. Right. They have an emotional component. We're not going to look at the physical component. We have to look at all because we are all of those people. Right. right. And you are making a major lifestyle change that is going to impact every area of your life. Right. Work, play, worship, relaxation. Right. How can we not address? address that when we're treating that person. And this is also not to say that if you have adversity in your life, that hello, we all have had adversity. But if you have a adversity in your life that you, you, it's not like you're predetermined to end up a basket case. And right. we've, we've talked about those little things sort of here and there. And next week we're going to talk about the, so, so those in more detail. And those are those, and, you know, a lot of those people become inspirational speakers, right, who have come from ginormous adversity, had good, like, you know, good things that have fallen into place in their life and that they've worked very hard for and then go on to change their lives. And so I think that that's, that's also one of those things. And that's what, you know, you talk about that every single time we get together. There is always hope. There is always a way that you can work 
through, over, under, and around things that have happened in your life to be able to be more successful, to be able to get, then go, all right, I can take my insulin and I'll take a walk around the block and yes. I'll have, and I'll have less chips. And developing what, what we call today resiliency skills, yeah. coping skills, resiliency skills, bounce back skills, and, and even the stomach ache in an odd sort of way is a resili resiliency skill. Yeah. I, I am so amazed at the creativity of people, of what they have done to take care of themselves. <laughs> so let's focus on the creativity. Yeah. Let's, let's get them to use that creativity to go on that walk that right. will make it more tolerable. Maybe not fun, right. but tolerable. Right. Maybe you need headphones. Maybe, Absolutely. You, maybe, or whatever, maybe you need a transistor radio that you hold in your hand. We don't have to be super technical. I mean, maybe you just need to, it needs to be enjoyable for you to do it. Yeah. And, and maybe they like to take pictures. They could take a camera along and snap <laughs> pictures along the way. I, I'm, the, these are the things that we work through with people. You're very creative. You have already done, you showed me how creative you are. Now let's keep using that wonderful creativity in a way that's going to support your health. Yeah. And most importantly, your goals. What do you want? Do you want peace of mind, serenity of soul? Do you want health? Health is not the absence of sickness. A lot of people think it is. Right. <laughs> Changing the thought. That's resiliency. Right. And I think that, I mean, that's one of the biggest reasons why I really love this series is that the stuff that goes on in this part of your body is 2,000 million percent the stuff that connected to the stuff that goes on in this part of your body. And if you ignore this part of your body, it might be a bigger challenge to manage this part of your body. Right. And that there are a lot of people in all age groups who think that if you deal with this part of your body, you're less than, it's who cares, you don't want to know what goes on in this part. Of, you know, I mean, there's a lot of those things. And yes. so that's why I think this is totally fascinating because you can see the connections. You can mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. Things that happen in here sometimes are a result of things that have happened up here. Exactly. Because up here is where you develop what's called the internal model of the world. And up here is where you develop trust. And that's developed most of the time by the time you're less than two years old. Yeah. Is the world safe? Can I trust people to take care of me? So when I have people come in to see me and they are obvious that they don't trust the person who sent them here, their referral it's just looking for money and I'll say oh, our services are free. Oh, they're always looking for that. What, what are you going to gain by me showing up? Mm -hmm. Are you going to gain money? Well, that tells me they don't trust. So then the first thing we have to do before we do anything else is develop a relationship where they can begin to trust. Right. You and they don't sit there and say, oh, well, you know, when I was one year old, I couldn't trust my caregiver. So now I don't trust you. It's not that obvious. Right, 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 right. Because, right. And if it was, it would be significantly easier to solve all the problems in the universe and everybody would have <laughs> yeah. a smile on their face 24-7. But the right, it's not like that. Right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Oh, Sharon, thank you again. This has been wonderful. So next week we're going to talk about resiliency skills and talk and you know bring that that uh, that uh, vocabulary word out and and uh, and uh, talk about that. So this is this is wonderful. Thank you so much, and we will chat again next week. All right. See ya. Bye, Thank you, everyone. <laughs>